Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God bless you. I want to today listen more than ever to the Holy Spirit and follow Him as I speak because I sense that there's something important, not that there's not always important, but something that we want to talk about today that we need to be aware of. Let me pray first. I decree and declare over you ears to hear and eyes to see the truth. I decree over you today that everything in your life is coming together for good according to God's plan. I decree over you that every hindrance right now is broken and that what God intends for you, the good he has for you and your family, I decree and declare it's coming to you right now. In the name of Jesus, I command that all viruses dry up, sicknesses, cancers dry up, and the healing virtues of Jesus fill that spot with life, life in the name of Jesus. I command the drying up of the cancers of the finances in the name of Jesus, an abundance take its place. I command the drying up of the cancers in relationship and forgiveness and joy and peace take its place. Today, I decree and declare that God's people are coming alive, are arising to his glory, are being caught up in the Shekinah glory. And God, we give you praise and thanks as we plead the blood of Christ over every listener today. And thank you for healing in every part of their body, in every part of their lives, in their finances, in their minds, in their relationships, in their dreams, in their emotions, life, life, the life of Jesus Christ. And God, I give you thanks as you speak through me today and touch the hearts of the hearers in Jesus' name. Bring them alive, Lord, to your glory. Amen and amen. There's a scripture in Luke chapter 10 verse 19 and it says this Jesus is speaking he he told his disciples hi Lydia he told his disciples behold I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And I want you to notice one little word in there. It says all, all, over all the power of the enemy. The blood of Jesus. And because of the blood of Jesus, the authority of Jesus, and because of his authority, his power, on behalf of his name, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit and his word, which is life, we have power over all the power of the enemy by ourselves. Without the blood, without Christ, without the Holy Spirit telling us what to say, what to speak, what to decree, what to declare, we're wasting our time. We have power over all the power of the enemy. In Jesus' name, by his blood, and through the anointing 
of his Holy Spirit as we stand and root ourselves in his revealed word. I want to give a caution today. We don't want to focus on demons. We don't want to be demon focused. Because remember, we have all power over them through Christ. But we don't want to ignore their activity, especially in this last hour. And I want to make that so clear. We must not be demon-focused. People say, oh, the devil is after me. The devil made me do it. That's a person that is not understanding their inheritance in Christ. That's a person that is not joined to Christ through his word. That's a person that doesn't understand because they're not reading the word. They're not spending time with the Holy Spirit. The demons have no power over God's children. And so today, I want to tell you, don't give your power and authority to him. Mark 16:16 16, 16, Jesus says, "He who believes and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believes not, he that does not believe shall be damned." And listen, we've got to get past the lies of the enemy that says, oh, a loving God is not going to send anybody to hell. No, a loving God will not send anybody to hell. That person will choose hell themselves because he's done everything to make sure that we bypass hell. Hell is not made for people. It was made for Satan and his demons, those third angels that were kicked out of heaven, that who followed him and who are serving him, fallen angels. Hell is not made for people. People choose to follow Satan to hell. God doesn't send them to hell. God's word is true. God is a God of love, but God is a God of judgment. And he says, he who does not believe will be damned. That means you're going to hell. You'll split hell wide open. So get it straight. And there's so many ways that we show we don't believe. Verse 17 of Mark 16 says, These signs shall follow. Listen. The signs shall follow. We don't go looking for them. We don't go running after them. They automatically follow a believer. These are the signs. In my name, Jesus says, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay their hands on the sick, and the sick shall recover. And let me point out a couple of things here. They shall take up serpents. It's stupid. Totally ignorant. Again, totally detached from Jesus through his spirit. Totally detached from the spirit of God to deliberately go and pick up snakes and play with snakes because the scripture says, they shall not harm you. It doesn't mean that you pick it up. It means if it happens to come upon you in any way, you can be rest assured. It's like in the book of Acts, when Paul, after a rain, was picking up sticks to make a fire. And of course, the serpents hide in those dark places. And so as he pick up the sticks, a serpent latched onto his hand. And they shall not harm you. And again, you don't go drinking poison 
because the scripture says you will drink deadly stuff and it won't hurt you. That's if it happens for whatever reason. And listen to this. They shall lay their hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. And I want to start what I really want to talk about today with this. They shall lay their hands on the sick and the sick shall recover. Listen, do you have hands? Are you a believer? Power. You have the power and the authority in Jesus' name by his blood, through the power of his Holy Spirit, according to the word, to lay your hands on yourself and recover. And we've got to start doing that. we got to start taking authority over things in our body. In the name of Jesus, you are a believer. You have a headache, put your hand on your head and command that spirit of the headache, whatever source that headache comes from, command it to flee in the name of Jesus and command that. Healing takes its place, which makes me segue into something important. When you pray for a spirit or an illness or something to leave, do not leave that place empty. Again, do not leave that place empty. Whatever you bind, make sure that you're loosened what you want in that place according to the scriptures according to the scriptures if it's illness you release the healing virtues of Jesus in its place if it's lies release truth in its place if it's lack release abundance in its place release what the scripture says that is yours by rights of the blood of Jesus. Release that into the place. Loose that in the place of that thing that you bound and cast out. Jesus said, that, and I'm going to read this for you. Jesus says, when, when the evil spirit leaves a person, and goes in the desert places, Matthew chapter 12, Math, in Matthew chapter 12, I'm going to read verse four, from verse 43. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43. It says, When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walks through dry places seeking rest and find none. Then he says, I will return into my house from where I came out of. And when he's come back, he finds it empty, swept and garnished, then Going, he takes to himself, with himself, seven other spirits more wicked than he himself, and they enter in and dwell there, and the last state of that man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Let's look at a couple of things. Matthew twelve forty three. The unclean spirit, when you bind it out of the person, notice it walks through dry places. Dry places. It's seeking rest and it finds none. So it comes back. It needs a body. It needs a human body or 
some animal, like when Jesus released the spirits into the pigs, because they asked to be released into the pigs, they need a body to work through. So they look for rest, and they can't find any. So they return to the person they were delivered out of. And listen to this. This is so important. Verse 44 of Matthew 12. It says, when they come, they find the place empty, swept and garnished. It's swept and garnished. It's clean, but it's also empty. It's empty. And that's the problem with too many of us. We've got empty spirits. We've got empty minds. Empty of the things of God. When the spirit leaves, that spirit will try to come back. And when he finds emptiness in you, when he doesn't see the things of God, the Bible says the word of God is spirit revealed and it's to thoroughly furnish us. So when he comes and finds us empty, he goes, but notice, he doesn't come back alone. He brings seven eviler spirits. And that's why sometimes we wonder, what's wrong with you? I thought you were saved, but you're acting like the devil. So the, the spirits can come back. And if he finds a reason to attach himself, because you've opened the door by doing evil, thinking evil, he'll come in. But also, if you're living right, but you're empty because you're not studying the word. You're not praying. You're not drawing close to the spirit. Your life is prayerless. When last did you read the Bible? And I want to ask you another question. When last did you eat some food? The Bible is spirit food for your spirit. Your spirit is supposed to drive your mind and therefore your body. If you eat food to strengthen your body, to drive your body, to help you in, 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 your, in your exhaustion and whatever, the same way as in the natural, so in the spiritual, you have to eat spiritual food. And some of you, are spiritually anorexic some of you are spiritually sick because you're not nourishing your body you're malnourished so the enemy will come and find you empty and then you cry out but God I'm living right I'm living right yes but you're empty and that gives the enemy a place to fill. Our lives are created to be filled with the things of God. If it's not filled with the things of God, because it's created to be filled, it's going to be filled with some other worse form of worship. And the enemy will come in. And Jesus compares that that happens to an individual to this evil and wicked generation. And we see in this last day, this generation that we're in, we see the enemy at work in so many ways. Lawlessness is at an all-time high. Wickedness and lack of integrity is at an all-time high. Covenant breaking is at an all-time high. Lying, cheating, conning, never seen so many cons, it's at an all-time high. But God says, 
and I love it. He says, when sin abounds, the grace of God doth much more abound. You see, we're lights. We're salt. And lights shine brightly in darkness. So when it's dark, that's a time when we must be equipped with the truth so we can shine brightly. So we can salt. Imagine eating food with no flavor. This wicked generation. It brings me to a dream that I had this morning. I woke up. I don't know how early it was, but I couldn't go back to sleep. So I ended up getting up to write the dream. And at that time, it was 4.30 a.m. And this is what I dreamt. People were rushing into this building to get a good seat. They were rushing into the building, getting seats in, in the dream. I'm going, I can't believe this. And then I saw a young man standing in the crowd next to, I don't know who the person was. It was an adult because he came, his head came up to a part of the person's body. I couldn't see their head. I could just see him. And this young boy began to sing out. This child was about 14, 13 or 14 If it wasn't for the blood that Jesus shed, dying on the cross, he rose again. Jesus changed my life forever. And I woke up singing it. And for the love of me, I wish I had recorded the song. Because even though I recorded the words, I thought I'd remember the song, but I don't. If it wasn't for the blood... This young boy's voice rang out so loud and clear across that building, so sweet and pure. If it wasn't for the blood that Jesus shed, dying on the cross, he rose again. Jesus changed my life forever. That's the gospel in a nutshell. That should be every believer's testimony in a nutshell and what that child was doing was testifying he was doing what revelation says to do we overcome not only by the blood but by the word of our testimony and so in this dream i'm pondering when i woke up i'm saying god what in the world and I thought it was negative because the people were running in. But God said, listen to this. This dream is prophetic. This dream says in this hour, there's going to be a great influx into the church, into the places of worship. And the young people are going to be center forefront not just putting on a show because their mom sent them but because their hearts are truly captivated by the heart of Christ so that's two things we're going to see is already happening and we're going to see the Bible says in the last days there will be a great falling away from God there'll be a great falling away but simultaneously, there's going to be a great influx as the last harvest is called in before the trumpet sounds. So what I saw was that harvest. People just so hungry, not for church, not for a minister, but for the Shekinah glory of God. They're hungry for Jesus. For the truths of God. They're hungry for the Holy Spirit. Wouldn't you be a part of that? 
Won't you cry out to God for your young person to be a part of that? Instead of looking at ugly things, evil things, instead of listening to evil things, instead of being involved in sexual things before they ought, won't you cry out instead that their hearts will cry out to God like this young man in the dream, a young black man, probably 13 or 14 in the dream. If it wasn't for the blood that Jesus shed, dying on the cross, he rose again. Jesus changed my life forever. The church, hear me, with all the shenanigan that's going on, that makes me cry, even last night, and makes me cry tears, but also cry out to God, God, save the young people, touch the young people, snatch them from this evil, turn them around. God, turn things around for us. Turn things around for our nation. Turn things around, God. This dream is prophetic that God is going to cause his Shekinah glory to fall in the churches again where he, the fear of the Lord, is going to be front and center and it's going to be all about God. Just like this little boy sang and the young people are going to be center. And what's going to be center of it all? The blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus. The fact that he died and rose again. The fact that now it's not going to be something that somebody tells us, repeat this prayer, something in our minds or some emotional thing. It's going to be a real, true encounter with the living God. Jesus is going to walk into some young people's room and just show them his nail-scarred hands. Just show them his side. Just speak a word to them. It's, it's going to happen in this wicked generation. The light is going to shine bright, 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 bright. In the Luke version of this scenario where Jesus is talking about the seven wicked spirits, there was a continuation that I want you to hear. In Luke chapter 11, verse 27, it says, And it came to pass, as Jesus spoke these things about the seven eviler spirits, it says, A certain woman of the company lifted up her voice and said unto him, I want to pause. And this is one of the reasons why the Bible states through Paul that women are to keep silence in the church because the women in the first early churches especially in Corinth where Paul give this advice they would just shout out they were used to being independent women they were used to being women who interacted with the travelers, the the businessmen and businesswomen that were traveling, they would interact with these coarse, brawl, brawling sailors. And so they were used to defending themselves. They were used to being independent. And so they would just shout out, just like this woman did. They would just shout out. You know, whatever is on their mind, they'll just shout it out. And so Paul was saying, we need order in the church so women need to go home and let their husbands tell them whatever it is they want to know and that's why that scripture is there not because God hasn't called women to preach or called women to the ministry but because and it's still true there must be order in the church and so here this woman and I didn't plan to say that it just came to me by the Spirit. This woman, she lifted up her voice. Hear that? 
So she's not gentle, kind. She shouted out at the top of her voice. Blessed is the womb that bear you and the puff that you sucked. I mean, seriously? Did you hear the kind of coarse conversation that she's bringing up? Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that you sucked. And that's the kind of thing that Paul said we must avoid. And Jesus responded to her, yeah, that's true, but rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are they who hear the word of God and keep it. And again, I'm going to segue into the second thing I want to talk about today. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So first, I want to tell you, be aware that we have authority over spirits of darkness. We have authority over all the power of darkness. We are to shine as lights, but we do not do it without Jesus. We do not do it without Jesus, and we don't follow signs. Signs follow us. When we speak the word, he partners with us and cause that word to come alive. And whenever we deliver ourselves or somebody from whatever spirit is acting, whatever spiritual activity of darkness, we must fill that place with the opposite of what left. We must fill it. It must not be empty. And we've got to make sure we're eating the word pulling up our plates every single day and saying to the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what diet do I need today? What do I need to eat today? These are important. Blessed are they that hear the word of God, hear it with their heart, not only with their ears. How do we know they have heard it? They keep it. Blessed are they that hear the word of God, and keep it. Now I want to go with, with to First Corinthians chapter five. First Corinthians chapter five, and in this chapter, Paul is sending this letter out, and he's saying it's reported that there's fornication among you, and he's saying. The kind of fornication that's among you, even the Gentiles don't talk about that. And boy, the type of fornication he's talking about is a man having sex with his father's wife, his stepmom. That's tame compared to what's happening today. And that's how we know that during the last days, because sin is abounding. Now, here Paul is saying this kind of sex, even the Gentiles don't even name it because it's so awful for a man to have sex with his father's wife. See, in the, in one of the, the commandments, one of the laws in Leviticus is that a man does not sleep with his father's wife nor his father's children, nor his mother's children. So he don't sleep with his step sisters, step brothers. It's an abomination. So here Paul is saying in First Corinthians five two, you're puffed up about it. You're arrogant about it. In other words, they're probably like, huh, look what he's doing. We don't do that. We don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't have sex. We're pure and holy. He says, you're puffed up instead of mourning so that he who did this deed could be removed from amongst you. 
Listen to this. We see God as a loving God. And this is not a lie that the enemy has brought to us. He shows us this loving God. And God is loving. He proved it by leaving his heavenly throne and come to earth as a baby, as one of us, to die for us on the cross. He proved his love for the entire world. But there's a second side to God. He's the King of kings, the Lord of lords. He's a God of judgment. He's the highest heavenly judge. And so Paul is saying, point blank, get that person from among you. He says, I'm absent from your church right now in my body, but I'm present in my spirit. And I've already judged as though I were present concerning this man that has done this deed of sleeping with his stepmom. And this is the judgment in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When you gather together and also my spirit gather with you with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver that one to Satan so his flesh can be destroyed that maybe his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So it was a very strict thing. We allow pastors to stand in the pulpit who commit an adultery and we think it's okay and we don't understand. This is the last hour. This is the last hour. And God gave us a chance to get all this in order. When the church was shut down in 2020, he says, put that person out. And this is where the title of my message comes, comes from. It says, beware, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Paul says in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 5, Your glorying is not good. Your arrogance, being puffed up, it's not good. Know you not that a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump? My husband loves to bake fried bread and other things he likes to bake. And sometimes he'll ask me to set the yeast for him. A little package of yeast in a whole set of dough, and that dough will just rise. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? And we've got to understand in this last hour, when you are around things that are evil, when you're encouraging Things that are evil, when you're opening the door to things that are evil, and I'm going to talk to you women who are allowing all kinds of men to come into your house, calling yourself dating and having sex. When your children are there, you bringing in the spirits of those men and whoever they've been sleeping with, you bringing all that spirit into the house. To mingle with the spirits of your children. And you wonder why little Johnny acts like a girl. And you wonder why little Susie is so sassy and sexually oriented. You're bringing all that evil spirit into the house. You wonder why they act like jackasses at school. You have opened the door to these spirits that have come in and just a little leaven, just a little spirit coming in, just like a tiny grain of mustard seed faith is all you need to take authority over evil. The same way, just a little tiny bit of evil coming into your house will cause that evil to spread in your midst. He says in verse 7 of 1 Corinthians 5, purge out, purge out the old leaven, get rid of it, 
that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. As you purge out the old leaven, you become unleavened. You're purging out the evil. You're sweeping, garnishing, getting rid of. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And listen to this. He says, I wrote you an epistle not to company with fornicators. Fornicator is any sex outside of the traditional marriage that God instituted in the very, very beginning between the man that he created, Adam, and the woman that he created, Eve. A man and a woman. Adam and Eve. Not, not Adam and Steve. Not Eve and Madame. He says, I wrote unto you an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or idolaters, for then you must need goes out, go out into the world. Like I heard one of the little boys in my class, seventh grade saying today, I just totally ignored him. He's like, yeah, I'm going home. I've got things to do. I'm going down to the bar. And he named the bar Legendaire. He's going down to the bar. I totally ignored him. So, he said, you have to go out into the world. You have to go down to Legendaire. You have to go down into the world. He says, that's not what I'm talking about. He says, listen to this, verse 11, I'm telling you not to keep company if any man who calls himself a believer, a brother, and in this case, it was acceptable that the women were pure. So he didn't even write about the women because it was just acceptable in that age. This age, no, we got to say the woman too. So any man that calls himself a brother, any woman that calls herself a sister, if they're a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer, you know, I was like, no, 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 Railing, arguing, contending, no, 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 or a drunkard or an extortioner, always trying to scam somebody out of their living he says no don't keep company with them he said don't even eat with them don't even eat with a person who calls themselves a christian but is fornicating but is covetous always seeing people's stuff and wanting it and an example that come to my mind and i know i've said it before my mommy she loves beautiful things. And this one day, years ago, she went to a hotel and she saw this beautiful yellow rug with tiny white, white writing. And she purchased two heavy, beautiful, big, and she gave it to me. And a woman came and saw my rugs and she claimed it. She says, I claim those rugs in the name of Jesus. No, oh, that's covetous. That was my mommy gave me those rugs. <coughs> so covetous or an idolater. What's an idolater? Who do you listen to? Who do you worship more than you worship God? Beyonce? An idolater. Do you worship money so that you cannot pay your tithes? You can't give your offerings? What do you worship? Idolatry. We think of idols as only things, uh, these are like Buddha made with hands, but it could be things in our mind, ideas, ideals. We worship our job. We're there so much we forsake our family. Or a drunkard. Spend time 
on money on so much liquor and getting drunk or an extortioner don't even eat with them don't even eat with them he says put that wicked person from among you put them out I want to tell you this I think we're going to continue this message next week but I want to end by telling you this I don't know mention it before but it's so very important that your house be a house of peace the Holy Spirit will not work in an atmosphere that is not one of peace and that's what Jesus told his disciples whenever you go to a house leave your peace there if the persons are worthy of your peace your peace will go to them if not take it back it will come back to you peace Jesus is the Prince of Peace listen to me if you don't hear anything else hear what I'm going to tell you right now Jesus is the Prince of Peace because he lives in you you have peace living in you peace is one of the fruit of the Spirit that shows that you have the Holy Spirit in you peace Shalom is very important woman that your house is a place of peace it is very important man that your house is a place of peace you cannot have peace in your house if like Jesus told that woman blessed are you who hear God's word and keep it you're not gonna have peace in your house if you are not obeying the scriptures let me show you how let me show you an important way number one if you're not married you should not have a man or a woman in your bed there's no peace there there are evil spirits there there is no peace there number two if you are married the marriage bed is honorable but you've got to follow God's law woman I see a lot of you on Facebook talking about your husband he's not saved and blah 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 listen to me God says that a woman should honor and respect her husband it says in the book of Peter that you can win your husband without a word but we want did you see it says don't even hang out with a railer we wouldn't want a rail you did not know you this and that and that and you need to go to church and you need to do that and that and that it's railing it's a sin it's an abomination to God. It's disrespectful to your husband, and there is no peace there. You got to choose. I'm going to obey God, or I'm going to do my own thing, what I feel like. I'm going to give him a piece of my mind. I'm going to tell him what I think. At all costs, you honor and respect your husband. Hey, <laughs> like my cousin told me that another person called her husband a Neanderthal and she's like, yeah, but he's my Neanderthal. You love your husband. God put that man in the house with you for a purpose. I remember when I first got saved, I was told erroneously, wrongly by some person exuberant but totally ignorant of the truth person that when my husband come to the door don't let him in without taking authority over the spirits in him and all that stuff man let me tell you this my husband walked out my husband walked out and I told my husband I said you can go I've got Jesus and I don't need you well, he left. And I want to tell you, when my husband left, I did not have a job. 
I did not have money for food. I had a child to take care of. And I said to God, God, you promised you will take care of me. What happened? And God said, I did. I gave you your husband and you sent him away. I was like, oh my God. Oh my God. I didn't know God. I didn't know. He knew I was ignorant and I didn't know. I was like, oh my God. And he started teaching me. My husband came back. God started teaching me how to obey his word. It was not easy because there are times when my husband does things that I'm not pleased with. But God didn't say, respect your husband if you're pleased with him. So I don't argue. There are times when I get into an argument with my husband and I feel so bad about it. That I go back and I apologize. And I was like, I don't even know why I did that. Because I, I could feel the peace leave. So I tried to make my home a place of peace. A place of peace is not easy. But when you obey God, the rewards are plenty. You honor and respect your husband. You protect his ego. You don't disrespect him in front of people and this is the next part husbands are supposed to love their wives and do not be bitter towards them your husband is not going to help he cannot help but be bitter towards you if you're disrespectful to him especially in front of his friends especially in front of other people. You're disrespectful to him. He's going to be bitter towards you. Husbands, it doesn't matter what your wife do. God says, love them and do not be bitter towards them. Therefore, you need to take that thing to God. Deal with it with God. And this is what we're missing out on. Jesus sent us the Holy Spirit. To live 24-7 with us. And he gave us a manual, a Bible that we can download in any language. We can download in so many versions. We can download for free. We can download on any device. Even I see kids can pull it up on their game stuff. There is no excuse not to read the word. And you never read the word without the teacher, without the, the author of that word, the Holy Spirit, to open up and tell you what it says. That's where you get the truth from. Sometimes one word he shows you in the scripture that just changes your life forever. That's how you get peace in your house. It starts with you. Don't have people in your bed that you're not married to God's way. God's way. Not the woke way. Not the, the, the new way. And the next way you get peace in your house are those children. Oh my goodness. They are valuable. Sometimes I look at the children that I teach. And, and I can't help being awed at how beautiful their faces are. How beautiful. And I can understand why their parents holler at them, scream at them, tell them they're no good. One of the boys said to me, well, he was talking in the class to all the kids. And yeah, he says, my father, he just looks at me and rolls his eyes and says, I'm no good. Really? You just told a lie on God. When you say your child is no good, you're saying, God, up yours. You're a liar. Because God said that that child is a reward from him. And he said that child is fearfully and wonderfully made. He says his plans for that child is good, not evil, to give them a hope 
and a future, to give them an expected end. So when you say your child is no good, you're saying, in other words, I'm serving Satan. You're calling the spirits into your house. You're opening the door to lies. You're opening the door to dishonesty. And you're opening the door for your children to be angry with you and bitter towards you. The Bible says the only commandment out of the ten that has a promise is that children obey your parents in the Lord, that your days may be long upon the land. But in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4, after it repeats that, it says this, Fathers, bring your children up in the fear and the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And do not, do not provoke them to anger. And we got to say women, because the houses today are mostly run by women. Do not provoke your children to anger. That's where the peace goes from out the house. When our children are so angry towards us, that child knows that you don't care about them. When you tell them those things, if you do care about them, you'll do what God says. Train them up in the way they should go, not the way you want them to go. So what is the way they should go? You ask God. You spend time asking God, what way should this child go? So many children don't know what to do this summer. And some of you are just sending them to some babysitter who will cause them to deviate further from the Lord. They need to know their purpose. And this summer, spend time preparing for that purpose, whatever that purpose is. If they're called to be dancing, that's what they should be involved in. If they're called to music, that's what they should be involved in. If they're called to sports, that would, that's what they should be involved in. But most of our children want to be whatever they see in the media, what they see in the entertainment mountain. They want to have the bling. They want to have the notoriety. They want to have the popularity. And why? They're not being validated by their parents at home. They're not being validated by the people they live with. So when they look and they see that person getting all that glory, they want it. But they're not called to be a Beyonce. They're not called to be a Michael Jordan. They're not called to be whoever, the notorious Big G or whatever. They are not called. They just want that validation that they see these people getting because they're not getting the validation at home. And so instead of finding out what they are called to be, some of them are called to be awesome businessmen. Instead of being a rapper, they're called to manage a hundred rappers. Yeah, that's what they're called to do. But they'll never find that call if they're looking in all the wrong places to fill that void in their heart, then number one, they're not getting from God because we're not pointing them to God, praying them to God, loving them to God. That's where their validation comes from. And number two, validation from you as a parent and training from you as a parent. That's how you get peace in your house. So let's wrap it up. Change your habits. Purge out the old leaven. Some of you have opened doors to devils. You're railing at your husbands. You're railing at your wives. You're railing at your children. There is no peace for the Holy Spirit to work. And you're crying out to God, God, why is this not happening? It's not happening because the devil has deceived you into serving him instead of serving God. Purge out the old leaven. Purge it out. Honor and respect your husband. Love and do not be bitter towards your wife. 
get rid of the sexual encounters in your house and treat your children as valuable. Let them know they're valuable. Change the way. I had to do it. I'm going to tell you this last thing. When I was a young girl, I grew up in a home where my aunt was bitter because her father didn't acknowledge her like he should in his death. So once he died, she was left without anything but the house that we lived in. All the notoriety, all the traveling, everything that she had while he was alive. All that was gone because his family did not accept her. He did not set anything up right for her. At least she had the house. So she was hurt. Hurting people hurt people. As a result of her hurting, she hurt me and my brother with her attitude, with her behavior. She hurt us. She hurt us. Her sisters, they'll call us stupid. They'll call us um reptiles, they'll call us all kinds of names, told me that I would be a whore before I even knew what a whore was. I was afraid I was going to be one. I didn't know what it was, but I was afraid I was going to be one because she said that I was going to be one. Stupid. You're stupid. You make me sick. And when I got my beautiful little girl, she's beautiful. Beautiful, I mean beautiful inside out and beautiful in features. When I got my beautiful girl, I would tell her how stupid she was. And when I got saved, when she was about four, and the Lord told me, I heard the Lord. He says, no, you do not speak to her that way. But you see, it was already a bad habit. And one of the things you ask God for is wisdom, his wisdom. I always ask God, give me wisdom. Give me your wisdom. And you got to believe, according to James 1, that he's given it to you. Receive it. Study the word with the Holy Spirit and walk in it. Obey it. So I told her, I said, honey, I am so sorry. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. When I think about it, even now, it always makes me want to cry that I would treat her that way. Beautiful child, beautiful, always beautiful. But it was such a bad habit that I said to her, I'm giving you permission. Whenever I say you're stupid, I want you to look me in the eye and say to me, Mommy, I am not stupid. And that broke it after a while. I had to give permission to help me break it. See, we couldn't even do that. If my if my grandmother beat us for something that we tell her we didn't do, when she find out it's true that we did not do it, she didn't apologize. She would say, well, that beating it was for something that you did that I didn't know about. That makes a child angry. That made me angry and unloved. That's how I grew up, feeling unloved and angry. And I tried to pass that spirit on to my child. And the Lord broke me out of it because I obeyed him. And some of you, I had to purge it out of me. I had to get her help to purge it out of me. Some of you need to purge the evil out of you. You insist that you're grown and you can do what you want with those children. You brought them into this world and you can take them out. No. No. That's a lie from the pit of hell. God brought them into this world and only he can take them out. If you take them out, you've murdered and you're going to pay the consequences of it. If not on this side of the earth, on the other side with God. So again, again, purge out the old leaven. Purge it out. And when you purge it out, make sure you fill it with the things of God. Amen? 
We're going to continue this message next week because I want to talk to you this time about spirits attaching themselves to you and how to deal with it. The second part of this. So let me pray for you as I go. Ah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, speak to your children as they listen patiently to me ramble on. What do you have to say to them today? Hallelujah. 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 I decree over them a drawing close to you. You said if they draw close to you, you will draw close to them. And then the demons have to flee. I decree a drawing close to you. I decree the eyes opening up to see the depth of truth, the height and the depth of your inheritance in these precious people. You are their inheritance and they are your inheritance. And you give their children to them as rewards. Your reward, your heritage. God, may we turn back to you. And like that little boy cried out in the dream. May we too cry out like you did, like he did. If it wasn't for the blood that Jesus shed, dying on the cross, he rose again. Jesus Christ changed my life forever. May they encounter you, Holy Spirit, tonight. May each who's listening right now encounter you tonight in a special way, in their dreams, or you walking into their room, may they encounter you that will shift them closer to you and open the eyes of their understanding. May you remove the blinders of the God of this world from their eyes. May you break up the fallow ground of their heart. May a new day come. I decree and declare a new day coming to your house today, Pauline, Lydia, Aunt Eslyn. A new day. I am crying out every day for your families in the name of Jesus, for your children by name. I'm crying out for them. And I'm believing to see God's glory upon each of them. Lillian's seed, Eslyn's seed. Seed. I'm crying out, crying out, and I know God is hearing my prayer and shifting them, and things will happen that the enemy will make it seem like it's bad, but God is going to turn it around for good. So cling to God no matter what. God is going to turn it around for good, and God is going to bring you up closer to him as you allow him to purge out. Purge the old leaven back to the third and fourth generation. Purge it out, God. We lay it down under the blood and we turn to you and your truths. Grow us up in you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, let us shine bright like lights. And we thank you for doing it. And we thank you for doing it, Father, by your blood. By your spirit, by your spirit revealed word, and by your powerful name, in Jesus' name, amen. I love you. Should he say the same? I will talk with you Sunday. This is not a game. This is the hour to get serious with Jesus, to begin to grab a hold of the promises. Amen. He's looking for such. I love you. Be blessed. Be encouraged.